We've got a variety of people that are here, but Brother Metzger contacted me some time ago and asked if I would focus on the family. So you can call me Dr. <laughs> you can call me Dr. Dobson in a suit to this week instead of uh, blue jeans. So anyways, it's, uh, it's a delight to be here. And you've had Brother Sanders here, for those of you who sat through his uh, marriage conference. Uh, this isn't going to be his material. This is uh, material that I've gleaned. I'm going to admit up front, it's not everything that, there's nothing new under the sun. We all know that. Um, and so it's material that I've gleaned, but I've Michael Johnsonized it. It has my heart in it because I love family. I love your family. I love, I love everyone that's here this morning. And from the bottom of my heart, when I, I did a series um, sometime back at my church, and what I did, I wound up pulling together material of different lessons that I had taught in a Bible study class over the years. I put them all together into a series, and I did like a, like a family series for a while. And so what I've done the handout. In fact, if somebody could help me with this handout this morning, <clears throat> I just put that together this morning. So what we've got is uh, some some fresh bread for you <laughs> that we can kind of revive and put everything together. And um, I realize that everybody's on a different leg of the journey. Okay, we don't have we don't have. Uh, I mean, we've got people maybe that may be single. We've got people that are that are been married for quite a while. We've been married 36 years this year. I will admit right up front that I'm not like your normal Hollywood person. I've not had a lot of practice getting married over and over and over again by different people. I've only done it one time, but it's been successful. So I think I've got a little bit I can say to you that can help you. And I'm hoping that what we talk about today is going to be a blessing to you. Um, I've got, of course, four kids. We've got seven, five, seven, seven grand. See, they, they start populating a little, a little faster than the kids do. So we've got seven grandkids. All of them are in church. So I think I've got a little bit that I can talk to you about from a background that I know what I'm talking about. Right. I'm hoping that I've got something that I can share with you. And my kids all love me and my grandkids all love me and my wife. So uh, I'm coming from the background that I know a little bit about what I'm talking about. And I think that I could probably say I know a lot about what I'm talking about. I'm not Dr. Dobson, but, and I'm not a doctor, but I can certainly uh, talk to you from my heart and share with you some thoughts that, if implemented, will be a blessing to you and will help you uh, wherever you're at. Most importantly, because it's found in the Word of God. So I want you to start today. Let's let's start in in the book of Luke, and um, <clears throat> chapter twelve is where I want to begin, and then we're going to look also in Ephesians chapter five. Um, but I want to begin in Luke chapter twelve as I considered this the this conference and conditions surrounding the rapture. We know that there there is a major attack against. The nuclear, what we what we call maybe the nuclear family, the family. Uh, all dads on on TV are made out as doofuses. They don't have their act together. The woman is the one in charge. She's the one that calls the shots. Um, we've got people they, they make they make, and I believe I believe that there's an agenda to it. They're they're trying to undermine. And they're trying to push. We watched a video a number of years ago on the agenda. And one of the things in this agenda of those behind the scenes, those that darker side of government and even behind government, that's trying to undermine what made America what America was and what America was, what, what it stood for, what made America great and uh, what made America strong and successful and powerful had a lot to do with Bible, had a lot, of, lot to do with hard work, had a lot to do, not, not that all of the founding fathers agreed on everything, but they understood that the Judeo-Christian values 
Uh, even people that aren't Christian today, there are people, I've, I've heard people on the radio that aren't Christians, but they'll acknowledge that Christianity has, has been a major part of what uh, has made America strong and what it is, our work ethic and so forth. And so what they've done, they've, they've tried to undermine that by promoting this transgender movement, this homosexual marriage movement, and they get children away from the family. And they, I mean, even churches are good at that these days. And I'm not knocking the church this morning because we, we have Sunday school, but a lot of times we'll invite all of our families into the house of God. And then there's almost somebody standing at the door to say, we need you to go there and we need you to go there. And we need you to go there. And we got men going this way, women going this way, children going this way, little children going this way, youth going over here in the wild side. And we'll do our very dead level best to keep everybody divided until it's time to go home for lunch. And then everybody divides and goes their own way. The youth goes out to wherever they're going to go. The parents go out with all the old fogies. You see, what happens is we're not doing what, what we used to do when we were growing up. I remember growing up, we sat at the same table and we ate the meal at the same time. My When I got up, my dad was already off to work. My mom had already seen him off to work. And now she's feeding the children and sending us to to school for the day, and she's feeding us a breakfast. It's not like that anymore. And part of it is our schedule, but part of it is, if we're not careful, we'll neglect one of the most important things in our lives, and that's marriage and family. Marriage and family. And so here's what I want us to start. In light of contending or conditions surrounding the rapture, I want you to read this scripture with me. Romans chap- or Luke, rather, chapter 12, verse 39. And this know that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched. If the good men, now let's, let's just define who this good man is. The good man is the man of the house, the man who's governing, he's overseeing, he's the, he's the, the priest of his home, he's the, the, the king of his palace. If he knew When the thief was coming, he would have watched. He would have been prepared and not have suffered his house to be broken up. My concern as we enter into this meeting this week, and I've got way more material than I've got time. So I've got more real estate than I have uh, the ability to get it all covered this week. So we'll just kind of make our way through and I'll feel after the Lord and try to get the things said that need to be said. And hopefully we'll cover everything on your on your um, uh, handout this morning, and then more tonight, and then next week. But I want us to start off by thinking about this for a moment. There's a lot that's going on in the world today that is that has targeted our families, targets our marriages, it targets our children. And how many dads do we have here this morning? One, two, three, four, five, six, six dads. Okay, every one of us probably would say, if somebody touches my kids, I'm taking them out. But if we're not careful, being the goodman of the house, we'll allow things, we'll allow things to have access to our children that's going to take them out, and we're we're too blind to see it. So I'm gonna try to alert you to some things today that each and every one of us need to pay attention to, that I've tried to pay attention to down through the years as the Lord has given me wisdom to look down the road and see, okay, I need to be careful on this and I need to take care of this and I need to address that because one small little misalignment in the rudder will cause the ship to totally miss the target down the road. Are you hearing me this morning? You see, you can leave, and I, I may have said this from behind this pulpit. This isn't my first rodeo here in Montana. Uh, you, can, you can head out of New York Harbor and think that you're going to London or heading over toward Europe, but get that rudder out of, out of line, and you're going to be going around the Cape down the bottom of Africa. You're going to miss it. And let's not miss it today. Let's not miss it this week. Let's not miss it with our family, especially in light of all that is a that is aligned against you as a husband and as a father and, and as family as, and as Christians, let's not miss what, what's going on. Let's, let's be alert. Let's pay attention. Okay. There may be some things that I'm going to say to you this morning that maybe you've not heard. Maybe you've not been raised to hear this, 
maybe you've been raised in church all your life, but maybe this might, what we're going to talk about this morning uh, and, and over the course of the few hours that I've got with you, there may be some things that I'll say that you've not, you've not heard before. And I'm hoping that by the time we're done, that what we're talking about is going to help your marriage um, and help your family. Is that all right? Amen. All right. Now let's look at Ephesians chapter five, poke back behind here again, because I want to use this pulpit, Ephesians chapter five, and beginning at verse number 21. <clears throat> And I, it's a smaller section of the Bible, so I keep, of course, jumping back and forth across it <laughs> instead of getting where I want to be. Beginning of verse number 21, okay? We're going to read down through the end of the chapter. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning of verse 21, the Bible says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Wow, that's not real popular these days. Uh, I got to submit myself to Him as if it's God? Won't that go to his head? Well, a godly man, it won't go to his head. That's going to be the best thing that can happen to you. Because he, as God, as we're going to talk about in a little bit, has some characteristics and some obligations and some responsibilities as the man of his home that includes such things that God does. He provides for us, doesn't he? He protects us, doesn't he? That's what the Lord does. That's what a good man ought to do. So it's not saying we're going to set him up as God. You need to bow before me. No, that's not what it's about. I'm not Mr. Boss, as we'll talk about in just a little bit. Uh, but uh, wives are to submit themselves unto, notice, your own husbands. Okay, I'm not the boss of any of your wife. You're, you're, you're not the boss necessarily, but uh, you're, the, you're the authority, you're the leader, you're the priest of your home. So it's saying unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, Love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it, here's the reason, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself." That's another topic that we could spend a lot of time on, but we won't have any time to do that this week. For no man, verse 29, ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. I don't have to spend time asking everybody, when you went to bed last night, you probably repositioned your pillow and you got it comfortable because you care for yourself. You don't want a bad sleep unless you worked all night. <laughs> I'm sure when Brother Nathan come here this morning, he didn't just lay down. Well, maybe, I don't know. He may have plopped down on the floor over there. After you had a long, hard day of work, you can probably pretty much sleep anywhere. But probably he found a comfortable place. Why? Because he cares about himself. And so also we need to be caring for our wives. Okay, that's enough of that. I told you we didn't have time for that, and you guys are trying to draw it out of me, and I know what you're trying to do. All right. <laughs> but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we, notice this, are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so Love his wife, even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. All right, let's get into our, some of our notes this morning. Every one of us would like to say, I mean, anybody that has Facebook these days, they utilize this to their, to their benefit. We'd like to present to the world that we have the model family. We'd like to say that. I mean, you look online, and there are people that you know, they're having some serious problems, but you couldn't tell it by looking at Facebook. It looks like everything's together. I mean, my wife and I knew of a young couple. It looked, she was a pastor's wife. Her husband obviously was a pastor. And all of a sudden, I, I get a phone call one day from the pastor, and he lets me know some things that kind of left me a little troubled. I went to call back later on to see what it was he was looking for. And when I looked into my phone, I had two phone numbers for him. 
So I grabbed the one at the top and his wife answered the phone. And I thought, well, I said, I was trying to reach your husband, but maybe I've got your phone number in his place. He goes, okay, well, blah, 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 blah. We talked for a little bit. Uh, what I didn't realize was that phone call would open up a huge can of worms. And I would begin to see and learn some things about this couple that I had never known before. She was actually in the process of leaving her husband. She was in the process of traveling to a different state. She had no intention. I didn't realize at the time, but she had no intention of going back. There were some serious problems in their home that nobody could see because she looked like the loving, loyal wife, and he looked like a good husband that was eager to serve his church and his, his family. Uh, and it just, it looked, it looked, look great. The model fan. All of us want that. Long story short, she just got remarried to somebody else the other day. It was a heartbreak to see this, to see this happen. But all of us would like for people to believe that we, that we have the model family. Men, we'd love to be able to say that, that our wives, they're devoted in every way. I mean, we could talk about from the carnal aspect of things, how our wife is just the most beautiful. She's the most gorgeous. Uh, I'm, my wife's better than your wife and all that nonsense. Um, we'd love for everybody to believe that. And the wives would say, well, my, wife, my husband is better than anybody else's husband. He's a hard worker. He's, he's good looking and, and all this stuff. We could talk about a lot of these things. Uh, that's that's what we would like to project to people. We'd love to. We'd love to. You wives would love to be able to say that my husband is the most exemplary and model husband of anybody. Uh, we'd like to be able to say even that our kids <laughs> are perfect. They're angels. They were they were born with halos. I mean, they were born with a little socket to screw the halo on. And all we had to do is just flip the light on to make it glow. <laughs> all of you know that that's what your kids are. But you also know when you get home, <laughs> it's like we pull the mask off and we're ready to take it. Come on, bring it on, pal. You're going to defy me in front of everybody. I'm going to show you who the boss is. Okay, so we would love to be able to, to project that to everybody. But here's what I want you to put on your notes this morning. Model families do not come automatically they come with a lot of hard work. I had some, more than once, I've had somebody say, man, your kids are so well behaved when they see us out and about. And boy, I commend you on having good kids. They're all lined up. And I'm, I'm not, I wasn't in the military. I didn't make my kids march in staff and line up and dress right dress and march to attention, all that stuff. So, okay, you can be at ease and go to your bunk <laughs> at the end of the day. But, you know, being out in the restaurant and so forth, there were times when my kids needed a little bit of extra attention. And I, I very kindly and very politely and very courteously and very discreetly picked them up and smiled as I made my way to the restroom. <laughs> and go into a stall. None of us had to go to the bathroom, but we had to go to the bathroom. Close that stall and I sit down for a second, get right in their face and I say, you better never. <laughs> and I'd lay into them for a little while. Somebody, somebody told me, boy, your kids are so well behaved. And I just looked at them and said, well, it, it does take homework. How many of you would agree that it takes homework to get the kids yeah, doing what's right? Homework. And so it doesn't come automatically. But I want to talk to us about some things this morning that I'm hoping that will help us. Okay. The reason why it doesn't happen automatically is because every single one of us are infected with a disease that we call the Adamic nature. What does that Adamic nature mean for those of you who aren't familiar with such a term? Okay, we took on the characteristics of our first father, Adam, who sinned in the garden. And so ever since Adam and Eve in the garden sinned against God, there is something that has, that has trickled down and has infected every single man, woman, boy, and girl on the planet. And we have this thing we call this carnal, sinful nature. That's why you don't have to teach your child to lie. You don't have to teach your child. They don't just pick it up from their mother. Well, he's acting like his mother. No, it's not that. He might be acting like, like you. <laughs> Looks like you, acts like you. Okay, but it's more than that. It's deeper than that. It's that Adamic nature that they picked up, and we did it when we were kids. Uh, we, we know better than to steal a little cookie from the cookie jar 
But then we also know that if I did steal a cookie from the cookie jar and mom and dad come and confront me on that, I can say, it was her that did. She did. I didn't take it as you wipe the crumbs from your mouth. That's not the way it works. We understand. So it's this Adamic, this Adamic nature. It's like, it's like, a, it's like a, a car that has a bad alignment. Anybody ever had a car that had a bad alignment? Okay. What happens is that tire, those tires have a tendency to pull in the wrong direction. You ever, you ever done that? felt that? It's constantly have to pull against that. And if we don't address that bad alignment, this is just logic. And this is, any, any of you could have come up here and taught this this morning. It's, it's just logic. Because of the bad alignment, uh, there's going to be some consequences if I don't correct the bad alignment. The bad alignment means I need to go out there and see what's causing this car to pull to the right or veer to the left. And so if I leave it alone, it's going to start chopping up my tires. It's going to start pro causing problems with the steering mechanism on my car. It's going to cause further problems. It could cause an accident. And so I'm going to have to make some adjustments. I'm going to have to make some corrections. And so also, our children are naturally bent to do their own thing. And it's responsibility of a good, godly husband and wife or mother and father to make corrections along the way to get their children back in the straight and narrow. I feel a little song coming on. It's one that I sing back home sometimes. It just says, you don't want to say amen. <laughs> Some people look for me to say that, and it just kind of comes out after a little while. I bet it, I bet it has more effect if I say it like I'm playing peekaboo, right? If I do it from behind this monitor. An alignment. Sometimes we have to make some adjustments in our home. Sometimes we have to make adjustments that might require some humility in the husband. Okay, I think I know it all, but when I look myself in the mirror, I, I can say to myself, look, pal, you don't know everything. You, you, need to, you need to learn some things. You need to pay attention. You need, if the goodman of the house knew at what hour the thief was going to, if he knew what dangers lurked just outside of his marriage, just outside of his family, that he would be paying attention to get some things straightened out. And sometimes what we've got to do, it's more than just trying to correct the kids Sometimes I have to correct me. And there have been times, one time my wife and I, we were, this has been a long time ago now, we were going somewhere, doing something, and I was really wanting some, her thoughts on a certain situation. And she wasn't picking up on the fact that I genuinely wanted her thoughts. I wanted her, her opinion she goes, well, I just thought you make all the decisions anyway, so I'm just not going to put my input in. And it, I, I, I broke. I got emotional. I thought, no, I don't want to convey that. I don't want to. I don't want that to be in my life. I genuinely want to look at you. If you're to be the helpmate of my of my marriage, then I want to look to you for some thoughts. I I want to hear your opinion on this. I felt bad about that. I had to I had to make some corrections because I was conveying that I was Mr. Big when I realized if I took the time and I got on my knees before the Lord and I prayed the way I ought to pray, I don't have all the answers. And God has put into my life a godly woman that can help keep me in the right path. You know what? We need that in this hour. If the good men of the house, that's you men, knew at what hour the thief would come, he'd pay attention. He'd be making preparation for that. He'd be, he'd be looking for opportunities to get this particular area uh, reinforced and get this other part. And we need, we need to do that not so much with our house as we do our home. I should say that again, probably. We need to be more concerned not so much with our house, but more concerned about our home, our wife. That's the, that's the most awesome treasure we've ever gotten go. is that good wife. There you go. Men, I'm not going to get anywhere near done. <laughs> did we write anything down yet? I think we did write something down. Let me get, let me, let me poke back behind here because I'm, I've got a lot. Of, didn't I say I got a lot? I could say we got a lot of real estate, and there's a lot of real estate in Montana. But we're not going to make a lot of time if we stop at every rest area and get, share every thought that comes to my mind. 
All right, good families begin with good marriages. So we talked about the bad alignment. Our kids, they can appear so perfect, innocent, uh, but because of those same sinful tendencies, we have to make some correction. If we don't, further damage is inevitable, just like that, just like that misalignment on the car. So we can't expect to have a model family unless we determine, when I look in the mirror as a husband, I, I want to determine that I'm going to be the model husband. We need to determine. We're going to put it all inclusive here this morning. We need to determine that we're going to be the model spouse. As parents, we represent God to our family, to our children. The initial interaction, like I said as we were opening here this morning, uh, the initial interaction between a parent and the child is, among other things, one of protection, one of provision, one of authority, one of submission. And so our conduct as a husband and as a father must be godly. Our relationship and our interactions with my wife or with, with your husband uh, must exemplify the holy attributes of God himself because children are going to learn godliness and healthy interaction um, with others however it is modeled by the parents. It's, it's sad sometimes. Sometimes there was a TV show, I guess, years ago. Would have been way back. I would have been pretty young if I was even born at all. There was a TV show I heard of. I think it's called TV show. It was a TV show called Kids Say the Darndest Things. Excuse my language. And little things that kids say. You realize... <laughs> I've been stunned when my, we all of us say, man, I, I said that and that sounded just like my dad. Same thing we understand. Our kids will say things. You know where they're picking it up at. They're not just picking it. We can't blame it all on the public school. We can't blame it all on wherever else they've been. Sometimes they pick it up from us. And so all the more reason for us to be the, the men and the women we ought to be. Let's get into some of these notes and try. Brother, what time are we supposed to be done this morning? Five minutes. Let's stand. Okay. 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 So I've got I've got some time. We'll try to we'll try to get at least all the answers for you this morning. Okay. Is anybody getting anything from this so far? So far. All right. Number one, your marriage. Let me uh, start to make sure some things. Yeah, your marriage should never take a back seat. Your marriage should never take a back seat. Um, <clears throat> it's a mistake for parents to put all of their loving energy into little Johnny and little Susan, or Susie, and neglect their marriage. There are people that they're, they're so, their kids become their world to a fault. It's like they, they put all of their attention into their children and they begin to neglect the one that brought him into this world. And so I want to I challenge us on that just for a little bit because all of these misdirected energies that's been poured into your children can cause harm to your marriage. I've, we've probably all known people that they, maybe, that they, they, they seemed everything was good until the kids all grew up and moved away, and then all of a sudden, mom and dad don't even know each other. They, ha they can't live together anymore and wind up getting a divorce. It's a sad thing. And what they've done, they poured everything into the kids. They lived for the kids. Their kids were their life. And then they realize when the kids move out that they're like living with a stranger. They don't even know each other. Sometimes they're even sleeping in separate bedrooms. They, they're just, they've been so caught up in life uh, again, I want, I want to keep drawing our attention back to that good man of the house, paying attention to what's going on in your home so that these things don't happen to you because it happens so quickly. It's like I just blinked and I, wo I woke up one day and I realized that all of my kids are basically grown and I've got seven grandkids and I'm seeing my children live out the life that I lived. It's like Twilight Zone. It's like, boom, it's like happened so quickly. And I sit sometimes as I watch them and I get real emotional. And most of you probably, if you know me at all, you know I'm a pretty emotional guy. I, I just, I about break down. 
thinking that it went so fast. Do I do I look back necessarily with regret? No, there are some things obviously that I regret, but I look back and realize I, I love my kids, but it happened so fast. I loved my children, even uh, all of my kids. I, it wasn't uncommon for me to be holding them, hugging them, smooching them, going in and out of Walmart. I could care less what anybody thought about the love that I had for my kids. But it's like it happened so fast. Now I'm doing that to my grandkids and watching my kids do it. Life goes fast. That's what I'm getting at. Life goes fast. And so we don't have time to say, well, I'm going to get that fixed in my marriage later on. I'm going to get that fixed in my personal life later on. No, I want you to ch- I want to challenge you to get that fixed now in, the, in your life right now. Don't wait until tomorrow. Do it now. Do it this morning before the service is over. When the altars are opened up, get it fixed now. Pray and ask the Lord to help you to be the man that you ought to be. Amen. All right. Uh, a broken marriage is a broken home, and a broken home breaks children's hearts. Sad state. On the other hand, a healthy marriage is vital for a healthy family. That's what I want us to have. This is what I believe uh, would be the heart of your pastor when he asked me, uh, in these conditions surrounding the end times, uh, to take a moment and focus on what's most important. What is most important? It's not your job. It's not to make another dollar because you may lose your job tomorrow, but you still want to keep your family together. That's most important. Uh, And even if you go broke, didn't you say that when you stood at the altar? Uh, In sickness and in health, in in, in, in poverty or in wealth or something like that. See, if, if we lose everything, baby doll, at least we got each other. Amen. So... Um, A healthy marriage is vital for a healthy family. Let's talk about a good marriage. A good marriage is a good model for children. What it does is it teaches children to love and respect each other. A husband or a wife who do not treat each other respectfully teaches, they teach their children to uh, disregard and disrespect others. So it's so important that we model that before them, that we, that we exemplify respect one for another. A dominant and a demanding husband teach children to disrespect their mother. We've got to be careful that, uh, that we don't go around bad-mouthing the mom in front of the kids because they're going to do it. And you know what they're going to do one day? They're going to break your heart because they're going to do that, and they're going to do it right in front of you. They're going to disrespect you your wife or their, their mother. I had uh, sometimes the children that would, that would do things and I would, I would defy them. I'd get right down in their level and say, you're not going to talk to your mother that way. You've not seen me talk to her like that and you're not going to get by with it. What, what, what was I doing? I was coming to the defense of my wife, their mother. I'm not going to allow that in my home. And there's a lot that we could talk about regarding, you know, the correction and, and things. We'll probably get to some of that, uh, before we're done, uh, by the end of next week, I want to talk about teaching reverence in your children. I want to give a biblical blueprint for raising godly children. And these are things that I've tried to implement in my own life. And, you know, we've still got one at home. Timmy, he's taller than I am, but he's still home. And I want to exemplify being a good husband and father and a good man of God in front of my son. All right? So a dominant and demanding husband. Uh, teach teaches his children not to respect the mother. By the way, the mother ought to be the queen of the home. If you're the king, everybody see me back there? If you're the king, she's the queen. You don't want to say amen again. That's all right. If you disrespect, they're not going to obey their mother. They're going to talk back to the mother. They're, they're going to expect that their mother is a slave. They're going to walk in and say, fix me something to eat. She don't have to fix you something to eat. Make your own peanut butter jelly sandwich. Okay. That's meddling now, isn't it? Let's, we, let's flip the table here a little bit. A nagging and insubordinate wife teaches her children to be disrespectful to their authority. So even the wife has to be careful how she lives in front of their children. And by the way, that authority is ordained by God to be their authority. We just read that just a moment ago in the book of Ephesians. 
that man that is to be the spiritual watchman and the high priest of his home, that man that is to be the goodman of the house, that's, that's paying attention to what's going on outside and doing everything that he can to protect that's in there. If, if the, the mother is not respectable of her authority, then she's going to raise children that are going to rebel against their authority. And they'll also eventually rebel against their mother. I, I knew of a, a family, the husband told his wife, you keep treating your son like that, he's going to grow up one day and realize what you've done. He's going to, he's going to resent you for it. He's going, to, he's going to turn on you. And I, I watched it happen. In some ways, it's been kind of back and forth, but it's, it's a very true statement. It's like we've, we've bent this so much that now it's kind of stuck and it's just going to be what it is. And we don't want to do that. We want to be very careful in that regard. So a proper balance of authority by the husband and submission by the wife that's illustrated by both mom and dad provides an excellent opportunity to teach love and honor and respect in the home environment. A healthy marriage will demonstrate true peace and happiness at all times. Had a young man come and sit in our home. He didn't have the peace in his own home. He come and sat in a recliner in our house and just kind of laid back and just with, with peace. It was like, oh, it feels so good to be here. Just sit back. There's no arguing. There's no hollering at each other. It was just peace in the home. I want that. I want that in my home. How about you? You want that in your home? Man, it feels so good to come home to that. And you know what? It doesn't happen automatically. Say that with me. It doesn't happen automatically. It's not going to happen by mistake. It's going to happen because you intended for it to happen. I hope this, hope this is helping somebody this morning. Conflict is going to be inevitable in any marriage. And you know why I know that? It's because the devil is the enemy of your marriage. Never look across the table at your wife or your husband and think that they are the enemy to your marriage. No, you guys came together because you fell in love with one another. You guys came together, not just because she was pretty and he was handsome, but there was something that drew you together and anything that would seek to divide that union, you need to see that as the enemy. And let me point that out to you this morning. The enemy of your marriage is on the outside trying to get in, trying to bring division. The enemy of your marriage is the devil trying to break you up, trying to mess up your family and destroy your children and destroy your marriage. And so we got to do everything we can to, to, to prevent uh, that from happening. And conflict is inevitable. There's going to be things that's going to present itself in your home. And you've got to, you've got to be man enough or woman enough to recognize that and take steps to fix it. All right. Children learn from us in times of disagreement. They learn things both negatively and positively, all right? Negatively, if a disagreement turns into a shouting match, or worse yet, a boxing match, hope that's not what's happening with you, then children are going to learn from our example how to handle conflicts in their home. They're going to handle it by arguing. They're going to handle it by swinging at somebody. So we've got to be careful that we be mindful. The good men of the house paying attention to those areas and, and, and being mindful of the little eyes that are watching us at all times and being careful that we're going to be that godly example. Not only do they learn negatively, but positively. They can also watch us work out our difficulties and yet see when it's all said and done, mom and dad love each other. Oh, that's wonderful. Mom and dad cares. Mom and dad still love it. Look at them hugging each other in there. <laughs> so they're going to learn to do the same thing. So let's remember something this morning. No one is perfect. So here we have a, a great opportunity to teach our children, this is a tough one, since nobody's perfect, in times of disagreement, we have a perfect opportunity to teach our children by example how to say, I'm sorry. That's... Somebody said a long time ago, that's some of the most difficult words to say, but we need to learn how to say those things. And what better place than to a husband or wife when we've had a disagreement? Or even to our children. There have been times I felt like I went a little too far with my kids. You know what I've done? I humbled myself, went into my kids, brought them in there, and with tears streaming down my face, I told them I'm sorry. 
Dad got a little too hard on you. Dad didn't read it right. I'm not perfect, but I love you and I want you to, I want you to forgive me and I'll try to do better next time. You know what that does? That wins all kinds of medals in the eyes of the kids. You and your dad, as being a dad or a mom. It shouldn't be abnormal for the kids to see their parents talking to each other, laughing together, hugging each other, kissing each other. <laughs> you don't have to keep that behind closed doors. Come here, baby, doll, let's demonstrate. No, I'm not going to do that to you this morning. <laughs> when we do this, you know what you're doing? You're investing into your children, into your family. You're being a good man of the house. You're shoring up these areas that could be that could be falling apart. Okay, we got to get going. Never forget, we teach our children by doing more than by saying. We give our marriage relationship a front seat. Interestingly enough, we give our kids the front row seat to watch how relationships are supposed to work. All right, let's move along real quickly here. The husbands are to demonstrate loving authority because of the time. If you'll forgive me, I've shared a lot that I think is already beneficial to you. So let's just look, let's try to get these answers in your, in your notes this morning. I can comment on everything, and I'm going to try to squeeze a lot in this week uh, or in these few hours, but let, let's just make through here, make our way through here. Every husband has been given the awesome responsibility by God to demonstrate godly leadership in the home. We understand in a normal Christian family, that decisions ultimately fall upon the shoulders of the husband. And we need to lead our wife and our children to become all that they're supposed to be for God. Listen, we're going to answer for God one day for our leadership. We're going to answer to God. We're going to stand in judgment, and he's going to judge us out of his word based out of Ephesians chapter 5 that we just read this morning. What kind of husband are we going to be? What kind of dad are we going to be? The man's authority was not won by, dual, of, by a duel of sticks deep in a cave millions of years ago, and we come dragging her out by the, by the top of her hair and tie a bone in her head and tell her, now I'm the boss. That's not the way, that's not the way it works. The Bible has given us exactly how a man's to be responsible and to take the leadership in his home. And just as God is the head of, the, of Christ, the father is the head of Christ, so a husband is to be the head of his wife. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. Just as the head is at the top of the body, it's suggestive of our role as men. All right? The Bible never indicates that the man is Mr. Boss that clearly teaches that the man is to be the spiritual leader of the home. I've said this so many times. Our wives ought not be the most godly people in the home. The man ought to be. The man ought to be the leader. He ought to set the example. He ought to, he ought to go out before the rest of the family and demonstrate this is how godliness is to be lived out. Men, don't leave that up to the wives. You be the leader. You've got enough of this wimpy you know, uh, manhood in America these days. Be the man and lead by example. Be a godly man. Be a man. Lead in your Bible reading. Lead. Okay, I'm getting off my notes again. Help me, Lord. Lead by your prayer life. You're the good man of the home. Watch out for your home. Be the first one up in the morning with your face pressed against the back of a chair asking God for grace and wisdom to lead your family right. That's the great, that's, that's your domain. This is your house. And it's not that I'm the boss. No, God's called you to be the leader. And therefore you're going to stand before God one of these days. And you're going to answer to him for how you lead as a husband. Men, as a husband, we need to be the leaders of our home. Okay, I got to get back to my notes here because it's so easy for me to get away from it. It's clear from Scripture and creation itself that man is to be the authority of his family. Quick, quick, answers to some, some blanks on your page there. He will then love his wife as Christ loved the church. Not only that, secondly, he will imitate Christ by meeting her needs physically and spiritually. Number three, he needs to be a leader and an example to his wife and children so that they can follow him with confidence. Amen. Men, think of your conduct in your home behind closed doors and ask yourself if you're being 
the godly example that God has called you to be? Are you providing a good representation of a holy God in your home? Can they look to you because you're the first picture of God they will ever see? Are you being that good picture of God that they can grow up when they come to that point in life when they realize that they need to surrender, they need to submit themselves to a loving God? Have you represented him enough to make them want to surrender their lives to Christ? So important. Then there's the wives, of course, that demonstrate loving submission. Contrary to the women's rights movement, submission is not rooted in male domination or dominion. Submission, when we read in the scripture, is part of God's plan. It's, it finds its basis in the scripture. In fact, it's seen in the Trinity. It's seen in the order of creation. What was the order of creation? God created man first, then he created the woman. Okay, it's, it's seen in the facts that we read out uh, concerning the fall. It was the woman that fell first, and she led the man to do so. And so God put her under the man. It's seen in all these things. Biblical submission is not slavery, but rather biblical submission is a sacrifice of one's own will on the altar of obedience. And what that does, it enables God to be glorified in everything. Biblical submission is not belittling and disgraceful. How do we know this? Well, Jesus submits himself to the Father, and Jesus is equally God. That doesn't mean he's less God because he submitted. It speaks of his greatness that he submits himself. In military, one person might be over another, but just because they submit to another doesn't make them better than another person or, or greater than another person. We just respect that authority. There's submission there. And we need, to, we need to acknowledge that. We need to recognize that. All right, let's see. Uh, we can look at Scripture, but let me just let me wrap up these notes here. In the fall, man, a woman exercised improper leadership and fell into sin. And then the man failed to exercise proper leadership, and the end result was a tragedy. And it's affected every single one of us. Biblical submission will win an unbelieving husband to Christ. Matter of fact, let me read the scripture for you there in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses, or verse number 1. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 1. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. That word conversation is not that she talks too much. It's, it has to do with her conduct. They can be one. If they're an unbelieving husband, they can be one to Christ by the conduct, the godly conduct of the wife. A biblically submissive wife demonstrates how to live a holy and godly life. A biblically submissive wife teaches by example how to be obedient to authority. And so in conclusion here, if we want to have model children, we need to learn to concern ourselves with being model parents. I guess that's basically the crux or the core of this lesson this morning. We want our children to be model children. We want to be a model family. We need to plan on as husbands and as wives, and I speak from the standpoint of a husband, I want to, I want to concern myself with being a model dad, a model husband. A wife who doesn't honor her husband cannot expect her children to honor her. And a husband who doesn't love his wife and treat her as the queen of the home can't expect to be an effective leader to his children. The final thought here, a man and woman who align themselves with, God, themselves with God's standards can then expect to have godly children who will follow in step with God's standards for them. Amen. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. So we need that. I've learned these, I've known these things all my life, but I, I realize as, as I've grown, I've been pastoring for a long time now, I've learned that not everybody's heard these principles, these truths. And so how important it is. Thank you, Brother Mike, for uh, inviting me and giving me the opportunity to share this. I want to share some more with you tonight. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to preach tonight. I'm going to do some more teaching tonight, and we'll do this next Sunday, the same thing. Let's pray as we close out 
Sunday School this morning. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity we've had, Lord, to, to share from the Word of God, to talk on this all-important subject uh, in these last days of how we need to pay attention to our homes. We need to pay attention to our marriage and our children. I pray that you would guide us, that you would speak to us. Lord, even when we're gone, even when we're home this afternoon, even when we lay our head on our pillow tonight, I pray that you would speak to us by the Holy Spirit. Lord, that our hearts would be open to receive. Lord, make us better men and women of God in our homes. Make our families examples to others outside the church. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Can you say amen this morning?